Welcome back to the Tapes Archive Podcast, where we release interviews that have never been heard before. In this episode, we have hip-hop pioneer Curtis Blow. At the time of this interview in 1997, Blow was 38 years old and was promoting his three-CD compilation, The History of Rap. In the interview, Curtis talks about how Don Cornelius, host of Soul Train, broke his heart, what hip-hop fans should go back and listen to, and how he foresaw how big rap music would become. As always, we have music critic Mark Allen at the helm conducting the interview. If you'd like to support the show, please like, follow, and subscribe to us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. There, we post other content and information not available on the podcast. If you'd like to read the transcripts for any of our episodes, please head over to our website at thetapesarchive.com. We'll jump into the interview after a quick word from our sponsors. Hey, this Christmas party is getting a little too quiet. I think it's time we liven it up with my favorite Christmas gift, Mr. Microphone. Hey, what's that? Well, you set the dial on your FM radio and... Testing, testing, testing. testing. Ah! Oh, the radio! Oh, These kids are having a fabulous time with Mr. Microphone, the cordless microphone that actually puts your voice on the radio. There are no attaching wires, so you're free to move around. <laughs> Broadcast over any FM car radio. Hey, good looking. We'll be back to pick you up later. You can broadcast in mono or with two more radios in stereo. Yeah. Professional entertainers use Mr. Microphone for rehearsing. And you can, too. It's practical and great fun for the whole family. And for only $12.88, they really make great Christmas gifts. The perfect Christmas gift at Walgreens, Woolworth, Woolco, Osco, Venture, Weebolts, Montgomery Ward. One last thing before we get to the interview. The Tapes Archive podcast is a proud member of Osiris Media, a global community connecting passionate fans with podcasts and experiences about artists and topics you love. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. How you doing? Not bad. I'm blessed, you know. What can I say? Yeah. Yeah, you have a, a quote in, in this press kit about how the driving force behind the creation of hip-hop was God. Do you really think God cares about what pop music does? Excuse me? Do you really think God cares about pop music? Oh, yeah. God is, has his hand in everything. God created everything. You know, he uses people as his tools in, in the creation of, of many different things that, 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 that I mean, that control the, the world, the way we think and how we live. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, Satan gets in there and messes all things, it messes everything up. But, but still, uh, God was the creative uh, influence and, and the motivating factor behind what I've done, uh, for sure. I used to always think it was, it was all me, you know. I had such a big ego until God humbled me, made me realize that he was the one behind everything I did. How, how did God humble you? Well, um, see, God has a way of taking everything from you to bring you back down to earth. And he has a way of just showing people, giving them signs to let people know that he is real and that he is the creator and he is the almighty, the omnipotent. Did you have everything taken from you? Well, you know, let's put it this way, you know. Yeah, without getting too uh, personal. Yeah. Huh? Without getting, well, I don't want to, you know, barge yeah, into your personal yeah, life. Let's, but put it, let's put it this, this way, you know, the music industry is, is a very up and down industry, you know. I had it all once, and right now I have nothing. I mean, let's, let's put it bluntly. You know, that's just, I, you know, I had it all and then I lost it all. I mean, I, I didn't lose it, but I just, I just, I quit. I let, I let it go. But it wasn't, it was my time to just say goodbye. And, and I left the industry. I stayed away and purposely. And, and, uh, I raised my family. You know, I have a family of five. I've uh, been married for 14 years. Today is my wedding anniversary, 14 years being married. Happy anniversary. That's Thank cool. Thank you very yeah. much. You know, and, you know, it's a lot of times, you know, people need to, to get, go and get back down to earth when they're, when they're way up there. This is, this is, this is what uh, gives them that hunger and, and that energy and that motivating factor to, to make them stand up 
on their two feet again and go out there and and, and really work hard and struggle to 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 really get things done and uh, get back up there on top. Because when you're on top, you, you think that you, you're there forever and you think that you're the best thing since sliced bread. And you also think that you could never fall. But um, how very wrong a lot of people can be, you know? Um, I wanted to do uh, two stories with you. One is I'm doing this piece about the assignment was um, how do you give depth to your record collection? And so what I wanted to ask you is if you're listening to, let's say, today like the Wu-Tang Clan or Puff Daddy or or Notorious Big, uh, Master P, what should you go back and listen to? If you want to go back, I think the late 60s and listen to... The early James Brown stuff, uh, not the early James Brown stuff. He started in the 50s, we know that. But um, the mid middle years of James Brown, when he really put together that hip-hop beat, which is so much synonymous with the format of making a rap record of today. Also, you know, the, uh, the Isley Brothers, the early Jackson 5, Jimmy Castor, and the Jimmy Castor Bunch. Really? Oh, my goodness. Okay. You got to pick up a couple of one of his old albums, like E-Man Boogie or A Groove Will Make You Move, that album. This man is a genius. He was one of my heroes. But the early Jackson 5 stuff is good, too. I mean, they have some funky, funky beats in there that kids just don't know about. What was it about those early records that hip hop picked up on and ran with? Is it is it just the beats and the grooves, or is there something more about it that uh, they had soul? That's all. Mm-hmm. They had real soul. I mean, you could, it's so apparent. It's just a feeling, and it's just a spirituality about the song that was so funky. Not just the break. Of course, you know the break was the most important part of a b-boy song was the break was when everyone did their best moves the breaks of a record were when the b-boys just did these moves and and, and had people a uh, circle of people around them you know they created circles of people around you you've seen that in saturday night with dance fever oh sure remember that right you know everyone's dancing in the club and then there's just one guy who who's the best dancer him and the girl just getting off, I mean, and everyone stops and they just create a circle around them and the two just go off, okay? That's the same thing with, with the feeling you get from these songs. And CD number one of the Curtis Blow presents the history of rap is, you know, you get that, that feeling of being there in a the club and you see the best dancer just create a circle of people around him and he's turning the club out. Everyone is happy. The thing that, that strikes me about listening to those three discs is even a really serious and important song like The Message is, it's got a, a bit of a lightness to it, you know? I mean, those records were, just were more fun, I think, than a lot of hip-hop is today. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, that's when we started. We started and, and we had a code, of, a code of ethics, you know, to, to make sure there was no profanity. You know, uh, of course, you know, we're from the ghetto, just like a lot of kids are from today. We had the same anger that the kids of today have, but we just chose to keep it wholesome so that we could open the doors for guys of today to, to really, you know, just let their hair down and twist it in its purest form, just rapping like they don't give a fuck. <laughs> Are you disappointed with the direction no, of taking? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. But I foresaw it. That's why I got out of the business, and I couldn't compete anymore because I just chose not to go down that road. And uh, you know, I, I'm not a saint, but I am a born again Christian. And what I've learned from religion within the last five years is, is you know, not to judge people. If you judge people, you get judged in the end. <laughs> And it's like, I love everybody, and, and I just pray for their salvation. That's all. When you were first starting out and rap was in its infancy, did you, you, you really knew that it was going to get as big as it's gotten? Oh, yes. Really? Definitely. Okay. When I first started, it was, there was a vision, and I knew that rap was uh, an art form, form of communication, uh, form of self-expression. 
matter of fact, I went to college and majored in communications and speech broadcasting so that I could sit back and analyze everything about rap. Because rap, to me, is sort of like speech, a speech. You know, you have your intro, your conclusion, uh, I mean, your intro body and conclusion. You have different forms of speeches, like extemporaneous speeches, which are, are speeches that people do without any rehearsal, just off the top of the head. That's like a freestyle. You have your demonstrative speeches that talk about any different subject, like basketball or Christmas. That's a demonstrative rap, basketball rap. You got your ego trip raps. People just talk about themselves. And you have your, you know, I put them all in these different little categories, gangster rap. All these different categories are sort of like speeches. They're speeches, and, and, and rappers are orators. So I sat back and I studied all the greatest orators of our time. JFK, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Barbara Jordan. And the qualities and these, these great speakers is, is what I mimicked and made part of my own image and my own character and my own rap style. It's very important articulation, you know, uh, uh, delivery, your, your vocal tonality, style, the whole nine yards. College was very, very instrumental in, in, in my success, and a lot of people should take heed to that. Where'd you go to school? CCNY. So it, it, it was definitely, definitely something that I, I knew was going to be around for a while. And, you know, I banked on it. So you must laugh now when you hear people talk about our rap is going to fade away or it's just a fad or something right. like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I stopped laughing. They don't say that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had somebody say it to me last week. And right. I, I said, it's, let's see, it's been around 20 years. You think that's a fad? I don't think that's a fad. You know, I think, <laughs> I, I think that's going to be around forever. You know? Right. One of the things that you do in the um, in the liner notes is you list off some of the uh, the major influences in the, in the creation of hip hop and you mentioned uh, there are a bunch of them that I had never heard of and I must admit to being a, a lily white guy at times and that, but I'm just wondering you know are, do you, how, do you, how do you feel are you surprised do, do people generally know like uh, D, uh, Pete DJ Jones and cool DJ Herc I mean are these names that, that are well known nah no okay I mean, may, maybe Cool Herc is about the most well-known, or Grandmaster Flash and yeah. Zambada. Right. People generally know those guys. Yeah, I knew the them. Other, the other seven? Nah. No. Okay. Uh, people don't know Pete DJ Jones was was just as big as, if not bigger than Cool DJ Herc. And, you know, people generally don't know that there were two different categories or two different markets in, in early hip-hop. See, People don't know that hip hop was around seven years before the first record came out. And within those seven years, there was two different markets. There was the, the ghetto disco rapper, and then there was, there was the b-boys. I mean, I mean, well, the ghetto disco was the b-boys, but then there was the, the middle class black disco. You know, that's where Pete came from. And a lot of the ghetto b-boys, the b-boys don't acknowledge the disco rappers because they want to keep the whole history to themselves. In all actuality, we are all pieces of, of a puzzle. You know, you got to put all those pieces together in, in, in order for you to get the full picture and the full picture of, 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 of hip-hop. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know about Pete or, or even, you know, Hollywood, Chiba, Lovebug, Starsky. Know, guys like that they don't get the credit and that's exactly why I put this series together because if you, if you talk to any one of those guys alone they'll say I'm the man I did it I'm the one that was the most important Sugar Hill said I will if it wasn't for us the rest of you brothers wouldn't have a job talk to Cool Hurt he won't give up props to the Sugar Hill Gang or Pete DJ Jones. You talk to Run DMC. They're talking about before us and before 1983. Before 1983, hip hop didn't matter. Ooh. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Things like that. You know, everybody thinks they're the man and they are the ones that put the most into this thing. And that's not even true. It was a combination of all of us together. Everybody's efforts together mm -hmm. pieces of a puzzle why do you think that rappers typically don't have long careers i don't know i don't, I don't know i don't know that's a 
very, very, very good question. Uh, maybe because our fans aren't as loyal as rock and roll fans are, or our fans here in America aren't as loyal as as the other forms of music. Uh, like, for instance, in Germany. I can tour Germany and sell out 2,000, 3,000 seaters anywhere in Germany at any given time just on my old stuff. That's because the people are loyal. We need to get loyal. We need to, you know, instead of saying, oh, he's old, he's washed up, you need to honor that man because they have been through it. They've survived and they've lasted. They've proven themselves. How people should think about that. If you toured the United States right now, what would happen? If I toured the United States yeah. right now? I don't know. Some places I might get five, 6,000. 10,000. Some places I might get, you know, two or 300. It's very, very different. There are, there are markets, different cities where I'm really, really hot. People really, really, you know, haven't forgotten. And then there are others who just don't give a hoot. And that's just the sadness of the business that we're in. I ain't mad at nobody. No, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you, you were saying that loyalty is a problem. Do you have any sense of why loyalty is such a problem? I'd rather not say. Okay, that's fine. I, I, let me let me throw out one theory for you and, and see if you if you buy this. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that that the biggest problem that rap has is that it's really done poorly live. I, I've seen very, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, a very few good rap acts live. I mean, people who do such interesting things with their records can't do it live. What do you think? Mm. I'm, I'm not asking you to address people, but uh, but that idea. Wow. I never really thought about that. But if you think about it, you very well may be true. I mean, all in history, throughout history, if you if you look at the great groups that perform live, those are the ones that sell the most albums. And if people keep coming back to their shows, that is correct. That's maybe one of the reasons why I've done 10 albums. One of the very few, there are a handful of us who have more than 10 albums. Wow, I got a pretty good live show. That may be it. For example, I mean, I just saw the Wu-Tang Clan the other night, and I think they do some real interesting stuff on their records, you know, musically and, and creatively, and they're good rappers. Live, there's six of them with open mics, and they're stepping on each other, and the only tracks that are coming out are, are bass and drums, and they sound terrible. So uh, it's just an idea. Anyway, um, let me see a few of the things I wanted to ask you if I can. Sometimes I, I, I get this question from a lot of people, and I'm sort of at a loss to answer it. Maybe you can explain it. White America seems to have really gravitated toward rap, and some acts where you would think that the acts aren't really speaking to uh, to white suburban America. Well, what is it about rap that uh, that brings people in? Well. Um Number one, it's the beat, of course. The beat, it will move you. Number two, it's, it's, it's basically that, that rebelistic, self-expression type rap, like just rapping like they don't care. And a lot of kids, you know, identify with that, you know. They, they, ha they relate to a lot of the problems that these urban kids, you know, go through. Even though it's basically suburban America that are buying the bulk of the records, but suburban America... They want to be like urban America because urban America is cool. They have not. The haves always want to be like the have not. They have the the expression, the, the slang. The, they always are on the front lines of, of creating new fashion, and it's just hip. Because when you get all those people together in, in one place, when it's really crowded like that, that's where most of the creativity comes out of. That closeness of uh, that tension. <laughs> when was the first time that you remember rap being co-opted for commercial purposes? I have the first national commercial on Sprite, and that was 84, I believe. And when they approached you about it, did you have any qualms about doing it? No. No, okay. When was the first time that you remember hearing somebody criticize rap for being too violent? or misogynistic or any of the other things that they criticize it for? 
somebody doing a diss rap? No, no, no. I just mean like, like you know, right now, I mean, see Dolores Tucker and William Bennett are out there all the time, you know, criticizing rap. But I'm wondering how long ago was it that, that people started criticizing oh, rap? Oh, at the beginning. At the very beginning? Oh, at the very beginning. Yeah, 79, 80. Really? Yeah. Was it anybody national or was it just... Uh, mm, who was the big... Cornelius. Of Soul Train. First time I went on Soul Train. I was the first rapper on Soul Train. Now, when I got there, I had The Breaks. The Breaks was number one record in the country, R&B. And he introduced me. I did my song. Everybody went crazy. And he came up to me to do a little interview while I was standing there. He says, yeah, well, I don't know why everybody is making so much of a fuss about this thing called rap. <laughs> but, uh... You know, it's my job, and I got to do my job, so it is. <laughs> he said that on, on TV? On TV. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and I was 19. Uh -huh. He broke my heart. You know, you don't tell that to a 19-year-old kid. It's supposed to motivate a 19-year-old kid. And even if you thought that, you'd think he would have been more diplomatic about it and just not said anything. Yeah, because it turns out that he's going to be, he's still promoting rap, to, you know, how many years later. Who was the first gangster rapper? I don't know. And no comment. I don't even want to get into that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me see, uh, just a couple of other things, if I could, uh, for another story I've been working on. I've been asking everybody I interview, if you became the overlord of pop music, what would be the first thing you would change? Wow. If I became the overlord of pop music, the first thing I would change is everyone trying to get them back to God. Trying to bring people to God would be my main thing. Hmm. Okay. All right. All uh, right. Yeah, and uh, is there anything else that you want to say about the uh, rap collections or uh, No, or I just else? think that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a must pick up for anyone involved in hip-hop. took me three years to do, and it should serve as the guidelines for many people who need the information. I was really shocked when I first put it on, and, I, and you started off with James Brown, and I thought, yeah, this makes sense to me. You know, I, uh, I had no, uh, you know, idea about the foundation of it, and, and I thought and I thought you did a really good job. I mean, these are uh, are three really worthwhile discs for people. Uh, thanks so, so much. Anyway, thanks, Curtis. Take care of yourself. Okay. Bye bye. Too. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed.